Yo, what's up? Dr. Swole here, MD bodybuilder, back with another episode on Swole Radio. Today I'm joined again by Menno Henselmans, who is a celebrated online coach and scientific researcher in our field of evidence-based bodybuilding, and also one of the most popular guests we've had on the show. So of course, he's back. Thanks for being on again. I'm back. (laughs) (laughs) So today we're going to be talking about bulking which I think is going to be really useful for people in the audience since a lot of people are going to spend most of their time bulking as bodybuilders. And it's really something where I think a lot of people kind of go astray and you really want to master if you want to succeed in this sport. So we're going to start by talking a little bit more zoomed in, talking about calories, macros, and then we're going to move on to more generalized, broader things like meal timing, calorie distribution, that kind of stuff. And at the end, we'll get on to some juicy, more advanced topics. So yeah, starting off, Menno, I guess the first question you'd consider when talking about nutrition would be the calorie intake. So what are your thoughts Mm -hmm. on the magnitude of surplus for bulking? And basically what goes hand in hand with that is your rate of weight gain. Yeah, I'm I'm a big proponent of what's called lean bulking. In contrast to the idea of uh, dreamer bulking that was advocated by uh, you know a lot of the, the pros on drugs and i think actually many of them actually didn't dreamer bulk as much as it looked like because you know originally the idea was uh go bad and you know gallon of milk a day yeah. and just getting really big if you know if you need to bulk there was no individualization or anything it was just like then you need to eat like four thousand calories that's kind of like how it started and like from even the like twenties onwards, I think that was kind of the idea until nineties, um, I would say. And then um, in um, sort of a, a contrast to the idea of bodybuilders that in the off season looked really fat, there was this idea that, well, how about we stay lean? And this also coincided with competitors getting to much, much leaner levels. You know, now pro level conditioning, is uh, it's way different than what it used to be. Yeah. It used to be, you know, 12 weeks contest. Now it's more like six months if you're lucky. And um, so it, it paid off to not get uh, too high in body fat during the off season. It was simply impossible even for many people if you compete at least once a year, twice a year. So uh, other than that, there's also a lot of research showing that, especially for natural Chinese, there really isn't much point in, in booking excessively. Now, I do think that many of the, the pros that got a bad reputation, like Lee Priest, um, a lot of their supposed off-season fat look was actually bloat, because if you're on a lot of gear yeah. that aromatizes, or yeah, that aromatizes, you also have very high estrogen levels, and that causes a lot of water retention, and testosterone itself in some individuals can also increase sodium retention, which can in turn increase water retention. Mm-hmm. So a lot of these these pros on, on drugs, you see them and they're like really big and swollen. They literally are swollen. So it's not all fat. And uh, you're, you're literally talking kilos and kilos, sometimes 20 kilos of water. Yeah. Um, and then plus the fat. So yeah, that makes a big difference in how they look. Now, if you just, if we go back to research, bodybuilding history aside, um, research is quite clear that in, in natural trainees, which is the research we have, mm. other than one study in Brazil where I'm not so sure if they were natural, Mm-hmm. Um, there really is much point in going over a very mild energy surplus. And mm-hmm. the energy surplus, is, the more advanced you get, the smaller it gets. So very roughly put, you can say that there is a certain amount of muscle that the body wants to build that you stimulate with your training. And that's really not much. You know, if you're gaining a kilo of muscle uh, a month, which for many people is really good progress, like intermediate plus as a novice, maybe you can do better, but maybe not even. But anything beyond intermediate level, that is quite, quite good. So metabolizable energy density that's actually stored in the body, 2,000 calories or something, not a lot. You know, divide by 30. And uh, you're looking at, yeah, not even 100 calories energy surplus that's actually stored. Now, there is a bit more because it costs more energy to store that energy because it's, you know, it's not just you, you get it from the food and you put it in the body. It has to be built. You have mm-hmm. to actually build new tissues with it break down the substances that come into the body. So, you know, estimates are more like 2,500 calories um, rather than purely the metabolizable energy density. But still, you're looking at very small numbers. 
And roughly put, if you look at research, you see that if you go into more energy surplus than that, then basically what the stimulus for muscle growth is, the excess is stored almost exclusively as fat. Mm -hmm. Now, it is a bit of a ratio. You know, If you go into 20% energy surplus, you'll build more muscle than in 5% energy surplus, but it's not much more. And the fat gain is a lot more. Yeah. So you get very steep diminishing returns. And that sweet spot's actually very narrow because at maintenance, especially for an advanced trainee, essentially nothing happens. Yeah. So you're fluctuating in between nothing happens and immediately spilling over into fat gain. So for bulking, I think what a lot of people don't realize is they sort of let go and become more uh, complacent, more lenient with their diet. Actually, you have to be more strict when it comes to energy intake. You have a lot more leeway in terms of having a higher energy intake. You know, you have more foods that you can fit into your diet. You want to fit a, try to fit a pizza in, you know, you can probably do that. <laughs> On the cutting, it's, you know, going to be, you can still do it, but you're probably going to be very hungry. Mm -hmm. So, but you do need to be strict. And like currently I'm on 4,200 calories. I'm also bulking. And I'm on 4,200 calories within say a 50 calorie margin um, by my best estimates. Cause I do go out to restaurants, but mostly it's sushi. So that's you know trackable re reasonably well. Uh, but I'm very, very, very consistent with that. Whereas when I'm cutting, I'm fine with, you know, if I'm at 2,300 to 2,700 to start the cut, anywhere in between is probably going to be okay. One day 27, one day 23. If I have a child that's roughly the same level, it's going to be fine because you're in energy deficit and the results are quite comparable. When bulking, you don't have that luxury. You also can't um, go way over on one day. Whereas with cutting, you can you know, have one very steep deficit day. I like to do some bulking spare modified fast, for example, mm. on rest days. And you just lose a lot of fat. If you do that while bulking, you get into that very steep energy surplus and you're at risk of just spilling over into a lot of fat gain. It's not like you're suddenly gaining a lot more muscle that day. Mm. So, yeah, it's much more important to be in a very consistent, very mild energy surplus. Like many people, it's probably 5% or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So, and like, how does the number change between beginners and advanced athletes? Uh, and the other thing would be if just for practicality, if people are tracking their gains through weight gain, how, what kind of guidelines do you give people? Yeah, you basically can't just rely on weight. So, but for all these numbers, I think the, uh, the most important thing, I mean, you can rely on weight, but it's not. Uh, the most important thing is that you're pushing up your energy intake and you're meticulously tracking your body composition. Mm -hmm. And you want to be at the spot where you're not consistently spilling over into fat gain, but you are consistently gaining weight. Now, usually the more advanced you get, the lower the weight train, realistic weight gain rate becomes. If you're an advanced trainee, just honestly, any weight gain rate that's positive and that's not spilling over into fat gain, like measurable fat is good. If you're a novice, you want to maybe err on the side of, if you're doing things really well, you could gain maybe 1% body weight per week. That's mm -hmm. quickly going to taper down to like 0.5% yeah. for most people. And then dropping off to maybe even 0.1 if you can. Um, you know, most people, you can't really aim for 0.1 because it's, it's too narrow. Mm -hmm. But even if it was a consistent 0.1 in advanced training, that would be good. And by advanced, I mean like really advanced. Uh, like honestly legitimately advanced not just you know you've been training for five years i mean like you've been training productively for at least five years or so you're close to your genetic limitations let me put it that way mm -hmm. so yeah the, the energy surplus i i generally say it's about 10 percent maybe in beginners and tapering off to like a few percent in advanced five percent for most intermediates the problem is that there's significant variability in how much people's energy expenditure goes up when they go into energy surplus so you can't just calculate maintenance and put 10% on it yeah. and then be like, okay, that's it. Because you see in some people, they're still in um, the maintenance. So for me, I have a very adaptive metabolism. I'm mm -hmm. basically at maintenance in between anything over 3,000 and up to, well, currently 4,100 4, calories. So that's I literally annoying. have like a 1,000 <laughs> calorie range where just nothing happens. Like actually nothing happens. It's really crazy. Like I've mm -hmm. tried it a few times. It's like, I almost can't believe it myself. So, uh, I mean, if, if there is something happening, then it's not measurable in a scale of one to two weeks at least. So it's like not worth bothering. Um, so yeah, you have to see if that you're actually gaining weight. That's much more important than the theoretical energy surplus yeah. you're supposed to be in. Because you're basically you're looking at a net energy surplus. 
not the expected energy surplus based on some calculation of your measurements, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's also another good point about you know about advanced people going shooting for smaller uh, surpluses. Where I think that as a more advanced athlete, you're better able to titrate your calorie intake towards a smaller level. Mm -hmm. Where like as you become more advanced, that that uh, window becomes um, so pretty narrow, and you need to be able to hit that properly. Whereas for beginners, I would suggest you know having a little bit more of a lenient uh, surplus where you know, they may not be able to hit a small surplus at a time and they might end up spending a lot of time just spinning their wheels and maintenance. Yeah, definitely. Moving a step up and going on to macros, just really quickly, obviously this is a big topic, but uh, just in broad strokes, what are your recommendations for uh, minimum versus maximum protein intake? Pretty much the same as when cutting. Actually don't think there's a difference. Yeah. In uh, research, we see very clearly that there isn't a difference in untrained individuals. Now, there, there is very limited research in trained individuals. There was a study from this year, one of the few that actually at least cross-sectionally compares protein requirements on a per meal basis, at least, with uh, protein synthesis and compared it to studies in energy um, balance. And now they looked at energy deficits and they found no difference. So that's one of the first almost direct studies we have on protein requirements, how they change an energy deficit in a training individual. And if you just look at studies on protein requirements in people that are in deficit, we still see that 1.8 gram per kilogram per day is sufficient. So based on the research we have. So I don't think there's actually an increase. Now in practice, you may go quite a bit higher just because your energy intake is a lot higher. Yeah. Uh, in fact, sometimes you actually have to start paying attention to protein quality because if you're on you know, 4,000 plus calories, then you may get that protein just from all the carbs and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you want to make sure that you get at least 50% of that from high quality protein sources. Many people don't realize that most protein recommendations are based on, on that assumption that over 50% of the protein comes from high quality sources. Um, then, yeah, you're going to fill pretty much the macros with overall similar guidelines as you would when cutting. Now, I, I like to go relatively high in fat because I think in when cutting, you very often come at the point where you have to compromise on something. Like you just don't have the energy. You don't want to compromise on protein, so it's going to have to be fat or carbs, usually. Yep. Now, when bulking, you have the luxury of getting everything up. So I like to be pretty royal with fat, maybe even 40%. I think above 40%, it's uh, hard to argue there are going to be very significant benefits, but mm -hmm. you could go maybe a bit higher. If, if someone likes it, I certainly won't argue against it. And they're still going you know, reasonably high enough in carbs. Uh, for most workouts, I think carb requirements are actually not a big factor. Um, I'm almost finished with uh, the first systematic review on carbohydrate requirements for strength trainees, like pure nice. strength training. Uh, it's a monster, an absolute monster <laughs> of a paper. Um, so yeah, I hope to be able to publish that uh, or you know, get it in peer review before the end of the year. Uh, but yeah, I don't think uh, that's you know a whole topic in its own. I don't think carbohydrate requirements are that large. And when bulking, I think from a lot of people, you know, if you're going over two, 300 grams of carbs, you're probably going to be okay with most types of workouts. If you're doing only strength training, at least. Now, yeah, and then you just basically fill up uh, what you have left. So for often when bulking, especially someone's at a pretty high energy intake, you come at a point where the macro split actually doesn't matter anymore because you've got enough protein, you've got enough carbs, you've got enough fat, and then, you know, the ratios at that point become irrelevant. Because you just you have enough of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting point, and it's it's cool that you're doing research in it. Because, yeah, like there's a lot of traditional bodybuilding wisdom that says you know you should be keeping you know keeping your diet clean and just having really high mm -hmm. carbs and minimal fats, basically all the time. And they obviously they they'll give some you know like bro science based off of um, some like physiology stuff and they'll just drop the word insulin a bunch of times but um <laughs> yeah like personally i also i also agree with that where i don't think that the exact partitioning matters that much when you're bulking especially when you're in an abundance of nutrition you you mentioned um that like sort of 200 300 is there like a floor or like a minimum of how many carbs you would recommend uh bodybuilders have for optimal progress so yeah, that's in our review, we actually uh, come to the conclusion that depending on your type of workout, if you're under 10 sets per muscle group per workout, 
which you know if you're not doing a bro split essentially then you're probably going to be fine even with ketogenic diets okay as long as they're still pre-workout carbohydrate provision wow and you are consistently doing ketogenic diets because i think a problem is that many people sometimes dip into the keto range but they're not keto adapted and then sometimes even if it's due to mental factors you just either don't feel energetic or you may actually get into the point where you don't have enough carbohydrates nor the upregulated resynthesis and uh, glycogen sparing adaptations that actually make you capable of handling that there's at least one study that i'm not sure if it was published because it was by jacob wilson at all um with some you know dodgy 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 stuff going on mm-hmm. before he uh, left tampa university uh, but that paper did show that people in cyclical ketogenic diets perform worse and there's one other study as well from uh, last year i think where they also found a trend for a cyclical ketogenic diet um, to i think result in worse i'm not sure if it was performance or body composition but at least it was worse than a uh, western type diet and other research on standard ketogenic or targeted ketogenic diet don't find these effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. It's good to yeah. It's good to know that people have that you know, range of flexibility open to them. In mm-hmm. terms of fat intake, you know, you'll often get asked by people wondering whether they can dirty bulk, you know, and just eat whatever they want. Does the quality of fats matter? Probably. Um, so the, the fatty acid ratio definitely matters, uh, at least for health reasons. And yeah. if you get if you get really dirty bulk and you have like uh, artificial uh, trans fatty acids in your diet, then you may actually get a lot of inflammation and stuff. Yeah. That could at least theoretically, hamper muscle growth and recovery. So there, it's definitely theoretically possible to let your health get in the way of your gains. We also I've seen in a couple papers on anabolic resistance in uh, obese individuals recently. So that's um, at least theoretically definitely an issue. And I think also um, for a lot of people, if you go all in on the saturated fat, it's just not going to be great for health. You have, to, you have to keep some balance there. Plus with fatty acids, there actually is a, a non-trivial difference in the thermic effect of food between different types of fatty acids. Oh, nice. So if sometimes you eat a lot of saturated fat, which tends to have a relatively low thermic effect, and then other days you go full Mediterranean, you have a lot of olive oil and avocado and stuff. The, the difference in energy expenditure is enough to cause uh, changes in body composition. There are some studies where they uh, get people on a fairly standard type diet and they replace a lot of their fat with monounsaturated fat, for example, mm-hmm. um, or medium chain triglycerides like coconut oil. And sometimes also with uh, omega free fatty acids like fish. And they actually lose fat purely because of that. So it's an isoenergetic diet. They don't change the total energy intake. They just change the fatty acid composition. And that can be enough to get someone from maintenance into at least some fat loss. So if you're doing it while bulking, you know, it's, it becomes harder to get into that sweet spot of just being in, say, 5% energy surplus because some days that may cause you to go at maintenance, say, if now you're, you have a much higher quality or healthier uh, distribution of fatty acids. Yeah, crazy. <clears throat> but yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think I usually try and rec- counts, counts people to just kind of aim for something that's sustainable in a, in a healthy way as well. So mm-hmm. aiming for, you know, around, I like the 80-20 rule, having around like 80% come from, you know, relatively whole food, unprocessed sources. Um, moving on and going up the ladder, talking about meal timing. How many meals should people be eating for bulking and the spaced out by how much time? I think you can't go wrong with four. Mm-hmm. Um, you probably can't go wrong with three. I'd say you likely will not maximize your progression with two or one. Um, and there are actually few indications, at least mostly health-wise and satiety-wise, probably not so relevant, that going up to six plus is also not great. So mm-hmm. most people are probably best with three to six. And then meal frequency per se doesn't matter so much, given the same protein distribution. Uh, one of the strongest um, papers for this is uh, the Norwegian F- Meal Frequency Project. Um, wasn't the most well controlled, but it's one of the best studies in terms of people bulking on three versus six meals, everything else being equal. Mm. And actually the trends slightly favored the free meal group, but that may have been because they were eating slightly more. So 
I say three to six, you're probably going to be fine. Uh, distribution wise, I'm a fan of having most of your intake and protein intake and also total energy intake be basically in between the workout and bedtime. And sometimes even going it over into the next day if someone's not so advanced. Essentially, you want to distribute your macros mostly in the anabolic window, or at least you know shift them a little bit more towards that zone. And there are a few studies that find if you do that compared to say having most of your calories in the AM and then training in the PM, mm-hmm. uh, that's not ideal. And if you think about it, um, unless you're if you're training every single day with high volume, then theoretically you're sort of keeping protein synthesis ramped up around the clock. But before the next workout, there, there has to be a bit of a dip. Otherwise, you're not even fully recovered. So you're just training too much. So if you're consuming a lot of calories in the morning of your training days, then your body cannot use those very effectively. It doesn't have nutrient partitioning signals yet from the workout later that day. So I think uh, some, some skew is, is good. Um, similar to when cutting, but yeah. it might be more important when bulking because you can the theoretical ceiling of protein synthesis is higher than when cutting. Hmm. What's the rationale for results being suboptimal when meal frequency goes really high? Yeah, mostly some some deleterious health effects like impaired hmm. insulin sensitivity. Um, at some point, theoretically, you may actually get below the leucine threshold. I don't yeah. think that's practically going to happen often, but hmm. uh, it is possible, especially in elder tra- elderly trainees, that the meals are just too small, too low in protein to mm-hmm. really ramp up protein synthesis. Uh, but other than that, yeah, it's not very, uh, there's not much theoretical basis to see why you said at least six meals, for example, would be disadvantageous. Okay. So anyways, I was about to start a company with an IV drip of amino acids for people, but maybe not. <laughs> um, and then the other that, thing that was... has been researched. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <Yeah. laughs> it's no better, but also no worse. Uh, if you do it with something like whey or casein, like some studies, for example, they, uh, they make whey yeah. absorb like casein and then you get very similar effects, for example. Mm-hmm. Do you suggest people have any partitioning between their macros throughout the day? Like, for example, you know, uh, skewing your carbs to the peri-workout window and then fats later at night? Um, if anything, I would partition carbs more later in the day based on the sofa at all study from Israel. But it wasn't in trained individuals. And it was mostly relevant for fat loss because the proposed mechanism is that you synchronize your leptin and adiponectin production more with the daytime because those are produced mostly with a sort of delay after carbohydrate consumption. Hmm. And it might also increase their their total production levels based on at least that one sulfur study. So, you know, that would be, it would mostly be a consistency argument again, because if you're bulking, then if you have more leptin, well, it it might even be disadvantageous in the sense that uh, if you're already force feeding and you now have even less hunger, then it becomes even harder. Right, mm-hmm. so it's it's again more. It comes more down to consistency than that. I think it really impairs muscle growth directly. Um, fat intake, I don't think matters how you distribute it. It's it's absorbed very, uh, digested and absorbed very slowly. There's no research, no mechanical basis for why it would really matter, uh, other than perhaps it's satiety being better if you consume it earlier in the morning. Even that's very debatable. Um, so probably not so much. Uh, when cutting is the Carb backloading is probably more relevant. And uh, I do think you want to have some pre-workout carbs. Uh, some people say like, I, I favor no carbs. Actually, even in mm-hmm. ketogenic diets, I recommend 15 grams uh, net carbs minimum pre-workout. Oh, yeah. It doesn't have to be like directly pre-workout, but within uh, one, one to two hours, ideally. Mm-hmm. And uh, at least 0. 0.3, 0. 0.4 gram per kilogram protein. So, but that's, you know, pr- and practically, really not difficult. <laughs> Those are not big amounts. Mm-hmm. The other thing was a lot of old school bodybuilders will talk about digestion in a kind of very hand wavy sense where they like, you know, talk about the importance of having foods that digest well. What are your thoughts on that? I think um, a lot of sort of bro, bro science ideas have a lot to do with FODMAP intolerances, like lactose yeah. intolerance, yeah. Uh, gluten intolerance, and then when people eat these foods, they get bloated and gassy and uh, it makes you look fatter. Just like being on a lot of aromatizing gear makes you look fatter because you're literally swollen with water. 
-hmm. And a similar thing happens if you eat foods uh, that have a lot of FODMAPs, which are fermentable carbohydrates that you do not uh, digest very well. So they, they sort of, usually what happens is they sort of start fermenting in your gut because they, they don't get digested or absorbed very efficiently. And yeah, you get, there's water retention, gas retention, which causes bloating and makes your abdomen look more, literally is more swollen and there's more water. Uh, and then people mistake that for fat gain. Um, I don't think it matters. There's actually now some research that um, wheat belly is, is a complete myth. I used to think there, there might be something to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we now have, I think, uh, well, at least one meta-analysis, one systematic review, multiple pretty well-controlled papers showing that the addition of gluten or whole wheat versus a non-whole wheat bread have similar body composition effects, mm -hmm. which is also interesting because apparently the extra little bit of fiber and stuff doesn't matter, or it's offset by like extra nutrients. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any, any basis for this. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's insightful. And actually that's kind of my grand theory on, you know, how a lot of people really gravitate towards certain exclusion type diets where they're just like, Oh yes. yeah. When I cut out carbs, I feel so much better. Like carbs are the devil. And it's like, well, maybe you have a certain intolerance to something that you just haven't identified. And I think that, you know, when you, when you start looking at people's uh, health, uh, profiles you you realize these kinds of things are a bit more common than people expect yeah it's, it's funny because then i see that with a lot of people that do carnivore diets and on the on the flip side you have people that do vegan diets that seem completely oblivious to the negative digestive effects they have so <laughs> yeah. a lot of people you know when they switch to a vegan diet they get like gas and bloating because they they massively increase their fault map and fiber intake uh, and it's not always the types they, they respond very well to uh, but they're you're like you know, vegan is the way. So <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. we're, we're going to ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just want to take a moment and plug Menno's personal training course. This is a, a pretty intensive, high level personal training course that's online. You can check it out on his website. And it's a great way to take your knowledge to the next level if you're a personal trainer, or just an athlete who wants to really become elite. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> moving on to more advanced topics. Something people will talk about is calorie and carb cycling, or they, you know, will say have higher uh, calories and macros on training days, or just sort of in a cyclical ramping type method. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Uh, carb cycling, I think, is is entirely and utterly ridiculous in every <laughs> possible way. <laughs> I really think there's yes. like there is there's just no basis for it, and. Um, and with all due respect to like Donald McDonald's work, his, his ultimate diet uh, books, I don't know anyone who has successfully followed any of that. Mm. I don't know anyone who likes carb cycling. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely terrible. If you, if you read my recent book on the effects of, of essentially carb cycling, it's bad for cognition. It's bad for your mood. The body really does not like having basically a complete lack of consistency in your macronutrient intakes. It messes with your appetite, with your satiety, your uh, mental energy levels. Uh, self-control so it's uh, even for those effects alone it would have to you know give some some really big benefits that is uh, essentially completely absent in any research we have there's also just no mechanical basis for why it would be beneficial but is it actually if anything most research points towards um, carbohydrates intake for strengthening uh, just not being that relevant in the first place and the timing especially not because you often have very long periods in between when you need the carbs you know the it's mostly the intramuscular glycogen storage. So it's only relevant when you're training a muscle twice within a relatively narrow time frame. Hmm. Now, even if you're doing full body every day, then you still have 24 hours in between workouts. And that it is often ample time for full glycogen resynthesis. Mm -hmm. So it, it really isn't relevant when you have uh, the carbs and even, so then you're, then you're not even talking, you know, one day higher, one day lower. Uh, you're just talking post-workout or something, but yeah, just, it doesn't matter. Now, calorie cycling, I think, is a lot more promising. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have to cycle for the, the sake of it. You know, some people are like, calorie cycling is great. And they're mm -hmm. just like, I have high days and I have low days. Like, why is one day high? And it's like, I don't know, it's cycling. <laughs> like, it, it doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> um, but if you're synchronizing your energy intake somewhat with your anabolic windows, I think that does make sense. And like I said, at least within days, we have some studies showing uh, beneficial effects of that. Like I said, in the morning versus evening, uh, most of the calorie consumption. And then if you, for example, work out late at night, then that would probably, uh, the next morning would still benefit. There's actually so, at least one study showing 
the, the next breakfast meal still benefits. It still has a higher ceiling of muscle protein synthesis. It's still in the anabolic window mm. uh, compared to if you hadn't trained the evening before. So mm. it, it would make sense to shift some of those calories into the next day as well. And especially for beginners, probably, then the timing doesn't even matter because you're going to get like a massive spike in protein synthesis that's going to last for days. Uh, but for an advanced trainee, that timing might actually become relevant. And especially if you're not training with very high frequency. So if you have, say, two rest days in a row sometime in a week, then I don't think you're going to, as an advanced trainee, benefit a lot from having a high calorie intake on especially that second rest day. And probably also not greatly from the first rest day because any muscle growth that you're going to get, you're probably going to get anyway because you have so much time uh, in between the, the workouts. Mm -hmm. And most research finds that the peak of protein synthesis occurs well before 24 hours in advanced trainees. So... I think then it makes sense to have those slightly lower in energy intake and go higher on the other days. In fact, that's exactly what I do. Sometimes even with one, for example, protein sparing modified fast day, if someone trains, say, six days a week, one rest day, then I go low in energy intake on the rest day. And the idea is that, um, for one, it, it, most people actually find it beneficial because it, it wards off like force feeding syndrome and those kind of things. At some point in bulking, you're actually looking forward sort of to cutting. Yeah. Like at least for a day. After a day, it's gone. And you're like, get me a few food. But <laughs> yeah. um, at least that, that one day is very tolerable. And what it does is it frees up a lot of energy intake that you can now put on your workout days where it's more likely to be put towards muscle growth rather than fat gain. So I think it, it should shift nutrient partitioning slightly favorably. There's very little direct research on this. Um, but I think at least it makes mechanistic sense. And it's, it's at least okay for adherence. So I do like calorie cycling to some extent. Again, not for the sake of cycling, but more for the sake of having lower energy intake on days where you don't think there's going to be a lot of muscle growth and the shifting those calories that you free up towards periods where they're more likely to be used for muscle growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes sense, actually. And something I kind of do myself a little bit. Some part of it is all, all almost just out of practicality where, you know, on training days, you have better appetite, especially when you're bulking. Yeah, it's kind of like that force feeding feeling where it's just like I don't want to eat anymore put it down mm -hmm. but um for yourself how much of a difference would you say you have in terms of say calorie intake on training versus those rest days uh, I train every day so I don't do it okay. uh, but on some clients it, it can actually be very a lot if I would train six days in my case I would have one day probably that's at like 2,000 calories and then the rest would go up to like this quick math it would actually go up to 4,500 Hmm. So 4,500, six days and the one at 2,000. Yeah. That no, would that... probably be uh, fine. Yeah, that's really cool application. Curious to see research coming out eventually. <laughs> Definitely. And now zooming out into kind of the long, long scale of things and periodization, what would you recommend as to the minimum and maximum length of a bulking uh, period? I don't think there's an inherent, well, there's definitely an inherent practical minimum. Uh, in terms of you can't do a one or two week bulk because you can't you don't have time to find that sweet spot of energy surplus. Mm -hmm. you, you know you need two weeks at least to get any appreciable um, idea of how someone's body composition is changing based on someone's current macronutrient intake. Mm -hmm. And then you need to do a few adjustments. In fact, uh, sometimes I'm cutting. I have clients that do weeks, sometimes months on the same energy intake. If mm -hmm. I like I hit the sweet spot right with my first estimate yeah. and it's like you know two months on uh no changes needed you're just cutting following the program military precision and just making excellent gains nothing needs to change often it also self-corrects a bit because as they get leaner the optimal deficit decreases but they're also decreasing in energy expenditure from adaptive from genesis loss of body weight so it, it self-corrects essentially the deficit becomes smaller but their energy expenditure goes down so it automatically happens uh, when bulking, you need to have much more frequent increases because as you're bulking, you're gaining weight, your metabolism is going to speed up rather than slow down. Mm -hmm. And that tiny energy surplus that you wanted is now gone. You're back yep. to maintenance. So you need to have relatively frequent increases uh, throughout the bulk phase. And I think that's a short bulk is just very difficult to fine tune that. Uh, so I do like relatively longer bulk phases, um, usually weeks to months. I do like mini cuts a lot mm -hmm. because. If you, if you don't do those, you bulk up from, say, 7 to 15% body fat, which I think is like a good ballpark for most guys. And for women, um, you want to basically get, you don't want to lose your menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. Often for women, actually, it's 
more of a matter of how lean they, they want to be. Um, and then they, and how comfortable they are going up to higher body fat percentages because mm -hmm. women have better metabolic health. So they can actually bulk up to much higher body fat levels. Mm -hmm. And it's almost never a theoretical issue. It's just what they're comfortable with. Um, so it's more an issue for men. And then if you go from say seven to 15%, long bulk, but then you also need to do a substantial cut again. And it's especially the longer cuts that, that kind of suck. Yeah. So if you do the mini cuts and you just stay lean uh, in between, which most people also prefer, when you when you've been really lean, it's, it's quite a, quite addictive, and uh, you want mm -hmm. to you want to keep it. So uh, I, I do like that a lot, and having shorter cut phases. Uh, but in principle, you you can do uh, long ones as well. It's mostly a matter of personal preference. Mm, okay. Some people talk about the concept of like bulking momentum where they they say you know that you really start getting to the groove of making gains after bulking consistently for a few months and conversely there's also this talk about you know muscle growth staleness where mm -hmm. the body becomes resistant to the training or bulking stimulus what do you think right i don't think uh, any of those concepts has scientific merit yeah but i do think there there's some practicality some practical truth behind it and uh gaining momentum I think can mostly be attributed to finding that sweet spot of energy mm -hmm. surplus. And I think the, the bulking stillness is mostly the effect of not actually being an energy surplus anymore because your metabolism has increased. So, and just the inherent effect of diminishing returns. You know, if you gain five kilos of muscle, you're closer to your genetic limits. So it's going to be harder to put on an additional kilo. Every kilo of muscle that you put on makes it difficult, more difficult to put on another kilo of muscle. And that's true whether you're bulking, cutting or whatever. So, you know, I think those are sort of the, the truths behind it, but there's, there's nothing physiologically where the body's just like, you know, well, it's been six months, you know, so uh, I think we're pretty much done with this program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that makes sense. And I definitely noticed this, that where when I'm getting late, late in, you know, late into a bulking phase, it's harder and harder to gain weight, where it's just like, if, just, if left to my own devices, it will just slope off at a maintenance just because I just don't want to eat anymore. And that's one of yeah. the reasons why I also like that mini cut strategy where I kind of like to set up my periodization as like long bulks with interspaced with short mini cuts where you can really quickly strip off some fat. And it also feels a lot better. Like after you, it actually feels great to be in a deficit after you've been in a surplus for so long. Mm -hmm. And it can also kind of, you know, rebuild that appetite again. Yeah. For a few days. <laughs> 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 yeah and yeah now moving on to a really contentious topic the p ratio and mm -hmm. optimal body fat percentage so i know that this has been debated a little bit but i kind of wanted to get you to speak on it a bit more mm -hmm. yeah i think uh, we had a, a big debate on it with uh or i had a big debate on it with uh, greg knuckles and eric trexler mm -hmm. um and i think overall we reached uh but the stance that we're both probably still um, uh, still comfortable with, whereas I think there's enough, at least theoretical support, that it, it's not advisable to get too high in body fat level. Like there's there's a potential limitation of inflammation. There's a potential, uh, or there's most likely an impairment of anabolic uh, sex hormone levels. Uh, whether that you know is meaning is meaningful is another um, idea, but. It, it, most of these things, it's like that. Like there's increased inflammation. Does it matter? I think, it, you know, at least we know that it can matter. So decreased sex hormone levels, now, theoretically it should matter. In research, we see not big effects, but if you extrapolate that over six months or longer, advanced individual, it might become relevant. Anabolic resistance, I think that will definitely um, have at least some effect. We see substantial decreases in protein synthesis in obese individuals. Uh, practically, it also matters probably a lot that Recovery capacity was a review paper actually published after the debate. Mm. Uh, two review papers actually, but were published after the debate. Mm. And both argued, uh, essentially what I argued, that recovery capacity is significantly impaired and there is significant anabolic resistance in obese versus healthy individuals. Now that means you probably have a lower volume tolerance and decreased protein synthesis should result in reduced muscle growth. So I definitely think there is strong uh, theoretical concern with being too high in body fat. Um, and like, why, why would you, is the, the argument. It's like, if you're a power lifter or something and you, you want to move to a certain weight class, now, of course, uh, I don't think these, um, these concerns are so important that they're gonna offset 
the, the advantages of being, say, 10 kilo heavier on stage, for sure, they won't. But if you're a bodybuilder primarily interested in muscle growth and you at least want to be somewhat lean most of the time, then I really don't see any reason why you would go up to uh, levels where you don't have any app visibility anymore. I think that's a very good practical guideline. You basically always want to uh, keep your abs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless no. you actually prefer not having them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Those people few, exist. <laughs> few people, but yeah, no, I, I, I'm on the same side where I think that you know the other consideration is the health consideration where I think that people will benefit from staying at sort of the lower end of their body fat settling point. And mm -hmm. just, just sort of health reasons, you know, like people, <clears throat> I think there's pretty strong rationale to suggest that, you know, you're going to be healthier if you're leaner for the most part. And just, you know, bodybuilding has to be something that is sustainable for people and people are mm -hmm. going to be doing this for years. And I'd rather people err on the, the side of health as well. Yeah. I think theoretically the, the ideal body fat range for health and for muscle growth are uh, quite possibly identical. Because mm -hmm. we see both health and recovery capacity decrease as well if you get excessively lean. And sex hormone levels also start decreasing. And fertility also starts decreasing. And the same things start decreasing if you get too high in body fat. So it's actually similar factors that um, impair our health. And they, they occur at similar body fat levels where we see decreases in uh, fertility, health, and theoretical potential for muscle growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think <clears throat> considering the body as kind of a holistic um, entity in well, right. the body just be works be... better at certain body fat ranges, basically. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, as, as I guess, to give some hard guidelines, what kind of body fat percentage range would you recommend men and women stay within? Very roughly, I think for, for most men, um, the ideal range is going to be like, like, Practically, I, I like to be on like 7 to 15%. Now, mm -hmm. Theoretically, you could probably go up to like 18, 19. And some people may not tolerate 7% well. Um, I think you have to look at like libido and how someone feels. And if they get injured more, if they're at low body fat levels, those are indications that's not a good body fat percentage for someone to stay at. For women, you can roughly add 10% to that. Again, I said, uh, like I said, it's, it's mostly a matter of uh, what, what they're comfortable with. Because women could probably quite safely bulk up to 35, at least 30% body fat without any negative effects. And if anything, it might be more positive because you have more estrogen. And that's the, for women, that's um, quite beneficial. Um, so if anything, actually, I would argue that for women, somewhat higher a body fat bulking may be better. But very few women actually want that. And it takes so long to get back to, you know, from 30%. Back to say their desired 18 percent that's not really practical mm -hmm. now for women there's actually if you have a regular menstrual cycle as a woman there's a really good sensor in your body that basically tells you you're too lean and that's your menstrual cycle disappearing mm -hmm. or becoming irregular usually first it becomes irregular and then it disappears so you don't want amenorrhea that's um it's not good for well-being health fertility obviously or uh probably resulting potential for muscle growth now, if you're going to contest prep, by the way, you have to uh, for most women. But then you afterwards, you want to get back up to the level where you regain uh, your menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. And what you said earlier about, you know, keeping sight of your abs, I think is a good kind of rule of thumb where I think the other thing about body fat percentage that people don't always talk about is the trackability where I think that mm -hmm. staying in a leaner body fat percentage range helps for bodybuilders because you're better able to keep an eye on where your body composition's at. Once you lose yes. sight of your abs, you really don't know where you're at. And it's very easy to stock away pounds and pounds of uh, body fat in your ab abdominal region that people won't keep track of and you won't, you won't realize they'll be like, Oh yeah, my arms are getting bigger. I must, it must be muscle, but you're really here. You've actually put on like 20 pounds of just visceral fat. Which is also yeah, worse. definitely. That's actually a very good point. It's, it's even visually very easy to tell the difference between five and 10% body fat, but the difference between say 25 and 30 is going to be quite a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that leads me to one last question about tracking composition and you mentioned, you know, where, where, when people are more advanced, you want to be titrating towards narrower, you know, rates of gain. And you kind of look at the body composition changes and whether you're, you're, you know, you're putting on a lot of excess fat for 
a more advanced natural bodybuilder, this might be a small range, for example, just gaining one pound a month. How do you assess, you know, how much fat versus muscle you're putting on? Uh, you need to measure weight and then you need some additional measure of fat gain. Well, I'm, I'm partial to skin fold calipers, mm -hmm. but do you really need to guide people how to use them? And not only do you need to guide people, mm -hmm. you also need to actually experiment because most people have a certain consistency or a certain way of measuring that they can do consistently, but they have to actually experiment. So one of the questions I get asked the most from clients is sort of the, the magical skin fold uh, measurement method. And usually what I ask is, I look at their measurements, I look at standard deviations of measurements of basically test, retest reliability, mm -hmm. and is the trend matches between what we're expecting, like if you're gaining uh, a little bit of weight and strength's going up, Mm -hmm. um, and one skin fold goes up and the other goes down, then you know, you know, one of them must be wrong. So you have to look at those things. And often I, re I request that they send a video of how you're measuring. And then I see if it's consistent, if you're on the right location, uh, et cetera. So you really have to play with that until they have a very consistent method. Consistency is a key word because if you're just using the same method every time and you're all roughly the right spot then probably it's good whereas mm -hmm. if you're doing everything as it theoretically should be but it's not very replicable the method you're using so often you're going to grab just a different amount of skin you're going to be at a slightly different location you don't have an identifier like a birthmark or mole which mm -hmm. you can use to get the same location then it's, it's still going to be crap uh, and just getting good calipers uh, some calipers are just just not usable um, so yeah, it just requires experimentation. Uh, waist circumference is a bit easier to use. Then it's, again, consistency is, consistency is really important. Um, generally, a fan of having people flex their abs and exhale all air. This is the most flattering measurement method, and therefore uh, one they can do consistently, and they're um, uh, and they actually also like doing because <laughs> also yeah. try to just extending your gut, like maximally distending your gut. That's also very replicable. But people really don't like it, especially women. <laughs> uh, I find that um, there's there's a very big uh, potential for bias in the measurements. And just the worst is just resting posture. Like, what does this even mean? You know, if you as soon as you tell someone just stand at normal, they're gonna mm. think about how they're normally standing, and they don't oh, know, yeah. so they're gonna stand different. So that that's terrible. Um, but yeah, that's it's you just need some experience. Look at the trend, and it's gonna require you know two weeks or so to, to get it right. Uh, but then calipers can actually be really useful. And I think even better often than DEXA scans, in-body is, is, is quite okay, but you still need repeated measurements. Any of those stuff, sculpt, in-body, tanita scales, you need to do it first thing in the morning, fasted, before having eaten, because mm -hmm. it's very susceptible to changes in hydration status. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's a very uh, uh, trial, trial and error method and just finding something that works theoretically and practically. Uh, so you can measure body composition. Visually, is 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 in an advanced trainee that's staying relatively lean, you know, decent. Uh, but I'm I'm always with clients, I'm always skeptical of it until I first see the data, because uh, if you haven't seen the data first, you haven't learned what the objective feedback is that you should be paying attention to, and therefore you don't really have experience yet. You know, you can do something for five years if you haven't had objective feedback on how you're doing, then you may not have learned much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, as, as you said, with body composition measurements or tracking, the most important thing is consistency. So people mm -hmm. just need to make sure that they are standardizing things. And uh, uh, yeah. by the way, completely random fact uh, of the day mm -hmm. that yeah. I think you might appreciate given your job. There's research on, um, um, uh, on cancer diagnosis, and I think also on ra radiology scans that uh, doctors uh, don't actually get better purely from experience. The differentiating factor is really whether they're getting feedback. So very often what you see happening is doctors, they take a scan and they're like, oh, I think this is cancer or like, no, I think you're fine. But then they don't have follow-up data. You know, if they say like, yeah, you're fine. And then five years later, someone does turn out to have cancer and they go to a different doctor. But that doctor that originally said they were fine never gets that feedback. Or it's five years later and they have no idea even what they paid attention to. So they don't know what they did wrong. Um, and vice versa, right? So uh, that, the same is true with body composition measurement and anything in fitness. You really need like objective data. And if you do something a few times, you have the data 
then you learn from the experience. And you can actually say like, uh, things like, I tried this and it did not result in muscle growth. Whereas often when people say that, it's like, eh, did you really? <laughs> yeah, no, that's super cool. And I, I, full, I'm, I totally agree where, you know, when you're optimizing any kind of replicable system, thinking about, first of all, how do I optimize this process is the first step. But the second process is like, how can I optimize my feedback loop so that I can refine it and the the quicker, like the smaller that feedback loop can be, like the more quickly you can get feedback that's accurate, the faster you can sort of iterate the process and become better. So yeah, no, that's a great point. And yeah, 100%. Yeah, so wrapping up now, I think this has been great for people, lots of actionable information. How has your bulk been going? You know, you mentioned that you've been bulking for a while. What were your stats? Yeah, pretty good. Um, I think by my best measurements, I'm up at least a pound, probably maybe a kilo. Um, of, of mostly, almost exclusively lean mass, I would say, compared to two years before, which is for me really good because I thought I was pretty much maxed out. Mm -hmm. um, but after my last contest, I was like kind of in the trap where I'm staying too lean and not bulking enough. Yeah. Uh, and also like, yeah, I think I'm pretty much maxed out. So not really doing everything 100% optimally. And now I've just been really, really consistently doing everything um, quite optimal you know, for two years, bulking with a lot of mini cuts. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm now still off my abs and I'm at 93 kilos and not full six pack, but I'm six foot one, 185 centimeters. So I think that's, that's really good. You know, of course, uh, if I get down to contest shape, it's the question, can I, can I maintain it? Um, cause that, that is always a hard reality check for people. Like how, how much, how much weight, especially guys, how much weight you think you still have when you're in contest <laughs> shape. <laughs> What are your plans for, I guess, bulking and cutting and, and, you know, contest prep coming up? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you mentioned you were thinking about a contest prep. I'm definitely not doing that until the pandemic's over. Um, just, you know, if shows being canceled and my travel plans are a complete nightmare. Yeah. I'm not living, uh, you know, I used to be super planned and you could ask me, where are you going to be in six months? And I'd be like, oh, Vietnam. Uh, or I have this conference in Hong Kong. Oh, yeah. Uh, but now it's, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. My last two conferences got canceled. Um, I, I live like month to month, <laughs> basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's thrown a wrench into every, everything for sure. And final question, actually taken from the Facebook group, is uh, has Meno ever considered performance enhancing drugs and why or why not? Take to Definitely. Um, I mean, with my travel lifestyle, it's uh, basically impossible. But when I'm, say, 40 plus, 50 plus, and my natural testosterone levels are going down, I'm definitely going into testosterone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. And then I, I'd seriously consider sort of going out with a bang and, um, you know, doing a, a, an enhanced <laughs> contest. Uh, I'd definitely be, be very interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, you know, it's still a while from now, so. Oh, yeah, totally. I just want to be a jacked 80-year-old, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that has been, you know, great conversations. always, Meno. It's always great to see your your logical and you know evidence-based approaches to things and your opinions Likewise. as well so yeah i think that's going to give people a lot of value where can people find you and what new developments do you have uh, metalandsmalls.com uh from my last calls you should already know i recently put out a book uh so that's been my main project almost got the audiobook finished hope to have that ready before christmas working on the last bits now which is so much work by the way an audiobook it's uh -huh. like you have to Listen to your own book and read your own book uh, three more times, at least. So, uh, and it's like 10 hours. So, yeah. Oh, you narrated and, it yourself? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. But every time the narrator. Yeah, you got to listen to it. Part, you have to listen to the whole part. Exactly. And there's like one part and they didn't pronounce right. So they have to, you have to do the whole thing again. So it's like an extremely large amount of work. In any case, uh, the, the paper I mentioned, systematic review, I'm working on that currently. And then I actually don't know yet uh, what my next project is going to be. Mm -hmm. wherever life takes you so nope. yeah i'll put a link to menno in the description below and mm -hmm. thanks for being on the show my pleasure